Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. It's always a memorable experience, a wonderful time, when we come to look at the pages of Scripture. Especially as we have come to the study of this special series we are on at present. It's been an enriching time. With our eyes, you have made us to see wonderful things out of your word. And Lord, you have been cleansing us because your word really has a cleansing power. The fire of the word has been working with strong conviction in our hearts. We are grateful to you, O Lord. We thank you because you have preserved such a word like this for us. We thank you for the spirit of the living God that will not leave us alone, but day by day, week after week, will interpret your word in such a way like this unto every one of us. We pray that you accept our praises in Jesus' name. Lord, as we come today, we come with great expectation, believing that you are going to reveal deep, new, rich, great, and high things, even to every one of us. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you will keep our attention. You will enforce your word in our hearts, that the application of your word, as it comes with power, with unction, with conviction, will actually reveal the things we need to correct in our lives, in our families, in our churches to us, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that through this word, you will sharpen and our sensitivity to the Spirit of God and to the way in which you want us to live. Father, we are praying that this word will reveal to us today things we need to know so that will be our best for you, for your work, for your service, for the people of God, for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Our hearts go up in gratitude to God because he has brought us together once again today to reveal the deep, rich word of God unto us. You see, the word of God says we should allow this word to dwell richly in our hearts. At a particular time, Jesus said, Let these sayings sink deep, sink down into your very ears, into your very heart. And as you come today and we look at the word of God together, I plead with you, open up your heart, open up your mind, open up your understanding to the word of God, to the spirit of God. And I believe that the word of God will do you good. We come to some important verses today. You will see that we have been on chapter 12 of Exodus for some time now. Because the verses are quite many, we couldn't rush over everything in one single study. You see, when we come to the word of God, we should always believe that God had a reason why these things are recorded. It says all scripture is given by, insp by inspiration. And it is good, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And because you see what had been written aforetime, we are written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. That is why we do not want to rush over any passage at all, because we believe that in that passage, God has something specific he wants to reveal unto us and you see it is the totality the completeness the entirety of the word of god coming upon our lives that will eventually perfect us and will do within us everything that needs to be done and i want to plead with every one of you keep on coming god has something waiting for you i pray that as we get into the story today the Lord will reveal himself unto you. Today we are considering Israel's departure from Egypt. Now we say we are reading the book of Exodus. That word, Exodus. Or if we put it in our just language, the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt. Do you know that this chapter is the very reason for naming the whole book, the book of Exodus? the book of the deliverance of the children of Israel out of the land of captivity. You see, God had promised Abraham centuries before this time that his descendants would sometimes be delivered out of the land of bondage. The time had now fully come that Israel would leave Egypt 
as planned, as promised by God. Though Abraham had died, God still remained faithful to his word, which tells us very clearly that no matter it may appear long, and God has given a promise, it will eventually be fulfilled. Look at Exodus chapter 12 verse 41. It says, and it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the self same day, that it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. I want you to realize something preserved for us here in the word of God. And I want you to think about it this way. If it was a Monday, there is an if there. I'm not saying it was Monday. It, if it was a Monday that God appeared to Abraham in, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. When he said, his descendants will be in the land that they, they did not know. And they will be strangers there. And he will deliver them out of that place. Do you know what this verse 41 is saying? It is saying it came to pass. At the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, when it clocked exactly the same, exactly that same day, exactly the time, that round figure, that exactly at that time it came to pass, that all the hosts of the children of Israel, the hosts of the Lord, went out from the land of Egypt. Well, there are a lot of things we need to understand from there. Number one, we need to understand that God will never delay. The self same day, the very time, the very moment that God had promised that Israel will come out of the land where they were strangers, that self same day they came out. So then we know that if God has given us promises, He will never delay. It will be that self same day. You know, He has a schedule, He has a timetable, and He works in His power and sovereignty according to that timetable, and it's never a moment, a minute late. That's another thing I need to tell you from here. Do you know that Moses, 40 years before this time, had tried to deliver the children of Israel, and he took loss into his son by killing an Egyptian. Eventually he ran into Midian because he was escaping for his life. He spent 40 years there before he came back. When he came back, it appeared that things were delayed. Eventually on the very day they came out, God said, that very same day that I planned, then they came out. Which means that 40 years earlier, when Moses had taken laws into his son, it was not yet time. And that is why God did not support him. He knew God was calling him. He knew God wanted to use him. He knew that he was to be a deliverer for the children of Israel. But the time had not arrived. And because of that, his action was premature. Do you know that many times today, there are people that take laws into their hands. It may be concerning marriage. It may be concerning the will of God, the call of God in serving the Lord. It may be that you have sensed the Lord wanted you to do something without waiting for the Lord thinking, the time is going, the time is going, I must do something now. You just get yourself into trouble because God is watching His timetable. When it is His time, you will not have to hurry like that. When it is his time, you will not have to take loss into your hand. When it is time, it will be that self same day. It will come to pass that the Lord will do what he has planned to do. Well, learn the lesson and learn it very well. Though the host of the Lord, though it appeared the promise might have seemed to be delayed, God was never late concerning the fulfillment of his word. If, he, if we had the Spirit of God, if we had the mind of Christ, there's something we'll never do. We will never foolishly charge God with delay or failure as, as he does what he wants to do according to what he has planned. Then we need to learn another thing. Here we're now talking about the deliverance of the children of Israel. And my brothers and sisters, I want to plead with you, trust in the Lord. Believe in God. Do not be dismayed. Do not be surprised at what the unbelievers and the rebels may say against you, against the Lord, against his word, against his plan. I want to remind you the first time that Moses appeared before Pharaoh when he said, I have a message from on high. I have a message from God. Let my people go that they may serve me. Do you know what that tyrant said? Do you know what Pharaoh said? 
Pharaoh thought he was all in authority and he held the whip in the hand. He held the final authority. He said, who is that God that we shall, I should allow the children of Israel to go? Do you remember? He fiercely resisted the departure of the children of Israel. And even Egypt, they fought against the departure of the children of Israel relentlessly as long as they could. But eventually, I said eventually, and I said finally, the word of God was fulfilled as he promised. That eventually we're reading today this wonderful passage containing the account of the deliverance of the children of Israel. Though you may know this verse, I'm going to refer to it and I'm going to show it to you in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, open it in your Bible. I know it's on the outline, but open it in your Bible. And in verse 13, you may want to mark it. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will walk and who shall let it? I will walk and who will hinder it? You may begin to ask yourself, God says, I will walk. Will Pharaoh be able to hinder it? You know the answer. God says, I will walk with all the Egyptians combined together. Be able to hinder it? You know the answer. I will walk with the Assyrians, the Babylonians, or Herod, or Nebuchadnezzar, or any other person. Will he be able to hinder it? You know the answer. No, they cannot. If you give your life to the Lord, and if you want to obey the word of the Lord, it may be that your parents may threaten. It may be that your husband may threaten. It may be that your wife may threaten to pack out. It may be that your boss may threaten. And they may, say, they may even challenge the power and the authority of God. But remember, God says, I will walk. And who shall let it? Who will hinder it? We're told in Proverbs chapter 21 verse 30, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. I'm going to put the name of Pharaoh there because that's what we're studying. There were, there were many devices in, the, in Pharaoh's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. That is Proverbs 19 verse 21. It says, another passage in Proverbs says, There is no wisdom, nor devices. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. If the Lord has planned to do something, he will definitely do it. What an encouragement it is to the believer today to know that God will do as he has said. Scoffers may scorn and scoff, asking, where is the promise of his coming? But we know that our Lord will come as he has promised. The believer's heart should rest on the unchanging, unchangeable promise of the Lord. Dazzling sights, threatening storms, and whispering spirits cannot confuse us, and they cannot destroy the word of God, because we are, we are convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that nevertheless, whatever comes, whatever goes, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Well, it is on the basis of that we approach this study today. It is on the basis of the faithfulness of God, on the fact that God says, I will walk and no man shall let it. It's on that basis we come to study this passage of scripture today and these verses of scripture verses 31 to 51 we have divided to three parts number one israel released by pharaoh wonderful thing israel released by pharaoh number two israel's long awaited deliverance you know it may take a long time it will eventually come it may appear that the night is fast spent and the day is at hand it will eventually come. It may appear that you have prayed and fasted and you have struggled and wrestled. It will eventually come. Israel's long-awaited deliverance. Number three, God's instruction to liberated Israel. God's instruction to liberated Israel. You don't understand. You don't know how marvelous, how wonderful that is. Of course, the Lord had been giving instruction to the children of Israel while they were in Egypt. But this is different now. They were liberated. They were taken out of Egypt. And they have been delivered as free people, as a people that have now breathed free air. And they have come out of the furnace of iron. They have come out of the Egyptian bondage. Now as they came in the deliverance, redemption of the Lord, and they were liberated by the Lord, he now gave them instruction 
what a wonderful thing it is. And as you are delivered by the Lord, as you come to breathe fresh air, as you come out of the bondage, out of the dungeon, out of the prison, in the prison, and out of darkness, then God begins to talk to you as his children, and then he begins to give you instructions. Let's go to point one. Israel released by Pharaoh. Israel released by Pharaoh. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12 and from verse 31. Exodus chapter 12 verse 31. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as ye have said. And also, take your flocks and your herds, as he has said, and be gone, and bless me also. If I had time, I could spend all the time on those two verses alone. Think about this. He, Pharaoh of all people, he called for Moses and Aaron by night. Instead of waiting till the morning light, instead of waiting for a convenient season, instead of thinking it over and thinking it through, Instead of still delaying like he has done before, he called for Moses and Aaron by night. Instead of Moses and Aaron going to plead, going to cringe, and instead of Moses and Aaron going to ask for it as a favor, he himself called for Moses and Aaron, and he called them by night. Instead of uh, saying, well, they will come. If they really want deliverance, I'm ready to release them down now, but eventually they will come. He called for Moses and Aaron by night. And he said, rise up. He said, rise up. You see, he was even telling them to be in a haste, to be in a hurry. Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. I'm not going to delay anyone, not a child, not a boy, not a girl, not a man, not a woman. You get forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. Go. Let my people go. He said, go. Let my people go and serve me. He said, go serve the Lord. As ye have said, every request you made, every demand you made, everything you wanted, go serve the Lord. As ye have said. Now you need to remember that before he had said he could go and serve the Lord. But he wanted a compromise. He asked them, who of you shall go? And then he said, well, you can go, but then leave your flocks behind. That was the time that Moses said, not and whom shall we leave behind? Now look at what he said in verse 32. Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said. In verse 31, as ye have said. In verse 32, as ye have said. He said, be gone. He said, now you can go. He said, now you must go. He was even hurrying them up. And then he said, bless me also. He said, I need blessing also. He said, can you take my prayer request before you leave? Bless me also. He says, Pharaoh, oh yes. Is this that tyrant? Oh yes. Is this the one that said, who is that God? Oh yes. Is this the one that told Moses, even in chapter 11, you will not see my face anymore. The time you see my face, the day you see my face, you will surely die. Oh yes. This is that same person that was now saying, you go and serve the Lord your God. My brothers and sisters, what do we learn? We learn something. God is in heaven. He is relaxing because he has uttered the word. And what he has said will surely come to pass. In Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. Open your Bible. In Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. As he said, and shall he not do it? As he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless. And he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. And I cannot reverse it when the Lord has blessed you in your life. Do you know Pharaoh cannot reverse it? Do you know that Nebuchadnezzar cannot reverse it? Do you know that Herod cannot reverse it? Do you know that Habalis or Jejuman, even Satan himself, cannot reverse the blessing of God? Oh, we thank the Lord that we're serving a never-failing God. We're serving an almighty God. We're serving a God that can do and will do all things that he has said that he has promised. You see at last. The promise made by the almighty God to Abraham. More than 400 years before this time was not fulfilled. The details of the promise were fulfilled literally. 
the experiences of Abraham's seed in Egypt was precisely as God has, had said. And even when God called Moses, God told Moses, he said, no, that Pharaoh, he will not allow you to go the very first day you get there, but I will not be late, just keep on on my word. Eventually, he will thrust you out altogether. You see, that shows us that God will make his word good. As God had decreed, so it came to pass. As God had promised, so he did. So then, we know that God was faithful to Abraham. That strengthens the faith of the children of God now, who have the seed of Abraham. We know how God was faithful in fulfilling his promises to Israel that should make the faith of the believer, the faith of the Christian family, the faith of the Christian church, strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. I want to encourage you, believe the Lord. I want to encourage you, stay with the Lord. Because the word of the Lord eventually will be fulfilled. I want to challenge you on something. You see, Pharaoh had asked for a compromise with Moses. But Moses refused. He will not accept the slightest compromise. Moses had said, Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not and hoof be left behind. I want to tell you this. It pays to have an uncompromising spirit that will not deviate from God's word in the slightest manner. You see, sometimes your husband will want you to compromise a little. Your wife will want you to modify the word of God a little. Your boss will want you to modify the word, alter the word, and compromise a little. And it also, your parents might want you to compromise a little. It may be that your teacher at school may want you to compromise a little. But I want to remind you, it pays to have an uncompromising spirit which will not deviate from the word of God in the slightest manner. You remember Daniel, he, he made a, co a covenant with God. And then he said, we are told in the word of God that he made up his mind, he purposed in his heart, that he was not going to defile himself with the king's meat. And it pays to serve the Lord uncompromisingly. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He, they made up their minds. They were not going to worship the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. He threatened them. He said he would burn them in the fire. He even eventually made the fire hotter seven times over. But these people of God, they were not going to compromise. And from the story, from the history of their lives, from the account of the faithfulness of God in their lives, this is what we learn. It pays to have an uncompromising spirit that will not deviate, that will not modify the word of God in the slightest manner. Let's now come to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 33. Exodus chapter 12 verse 33. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. The children of Egypt, all, they all came to the apartments of the Israelites. And they said, hurry up, hurry up. You must go now. It's time to go. Go and serve your Lord. Go and serve your God. You must not wait a day more. Those people, they saw the judgment of God. They were humbled and they were humiliated. The judgment of God softened them, bowed them down, changed them. And eventually they were even hurrying up the people of God. And he said, you must hurry up and go out of the land immediately. I want you to see that verse 33 again. I want to point to you, I want to point out to you uh, to what they are in haste. It says the children of the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. Do you remember those were the exact words that God had used in verse 11? Look at it in verse 11. Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, Ye shall eat it in haste. In haste. The same words that God had used. That they should get ready to take their journey. They should get ready to go. These Egyptians hurried the Israelites. And he said, very quickly you must get out of the land. Now let us go to verse 34 to verse 36. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. They had needing troughs being bound up in their clothes 
upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed. I told you that the uh, Hebrew word there means uh, they asked, they demanded, they, uh, they, they, they got from them. It says they asked, they demanded, they requested of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. In verse 36, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent them. It means they actually gave unto them such things as they required. As they required, which means they asked, they demanded, they requested, they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Now, I want you to realize something. Just that same very night, all the Egyptians had lost the firstborn in every home. Go back to verse 29 and verse 30. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn of, in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now I want you to notice that, naturally speaking, at such a time, they should have been very sad, and they were sad. They should have been mourning, and they were mourning. There was a great cry in Egypt. Naturally speaking, then, the Egyptians should have hated the children of Israel at this time. Having been plagued with the terrible plagues that we have studied, not only that, having just lost all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, they should have thought of fighting against Israel because they knew it was their God that plagued them and made all those firstborn to be dead. But you know how God fulfilled his promise? In fact, a similar promise had been given and also fulfilled in the time of Jacob. In Genesis chapter 35, it says, The terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. The same thing happened to these people. Even though the Egyptians had lost their firstborn, and the Bible called the firstborn the chief of their strength. Yet, they did, not, they did not even send them away empty-handed. They did not fight against them. On the contrary, that scripture may be fulfilled. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when the Israelites left Egypt, do you know how they left? They left with silver and gold. Egypt was even very glad that they departed. For fear of them fell upon them. Let's look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, we see how God made them eventually to leave from verse 51. And smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Am, but made his own people to go forth like sheep, and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. In verse 53, he led them on safely, so that they feared not. He let, he let them safely so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. Let's look at Psalm 105. Psalm 105. And let us see again the account of how they led the land of Egypt. I'm reading to you from verse 36. He smote also all the firstborn in their land, the chief of their strength. He brought them forth also with silver and gold. Look at this latter part of verse 37. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. I want you to compare that with Egypt. For Egyptians, not only that they were sick, for the Egyptians, all the firstborn died in every home, in every family, even among the cattle. Concerning the children of Israel, there was not one dead among the children of Israel. Not only that, it says there was not one feeble. Not one dead, not one sick, not one feeble, not one infirm, not one impotent person among all their tribes. You can see the goodness of God. You can see the power of God. You can see the fulfillment of the promise of God for these people. And in verse 38, Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them fell upon them. The fear of the children of Israel fell upon the Egyptians. 
So then we learn this important lesson. That according to Proverbs chapter 16 verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord. He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. We must go on to point two. Israel's long awaited deliverance. Israel's long awaited deliverance. I want you to see all the verses here are very important, very essential. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed. You know, if we stop there, that will be a wonderful message. The children of Israel journeyed. And as you think of us now, the church of the living God, pilgrims and strangers in this world, we have a race before us to run. The children of Israel journeyed. Do you know we are on a journey too? We are journeying from this place and we are going to the eternal, eternal city. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot. About 600,000 on foot. That one man beside children. That is without even counting the children. You have about, about 600,000 on foot. And they journeyed from one place and they were going to the place that the Lord had appointed. You see, as we talk about the journey, I want to remind you that in anticipation of this journey, they had been told that they must have their loins girded, their shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand, and they will eat the Passover in haste. I read it to you before. Let's look at it again in verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and with your shoes on your feet, and also your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. You see, the Lord knew that they were just about to leave the land of Egypt. And because of that, he said, get ready, get dressed. He said, your loins girded. Maybe you don't understand that. You see, they are dressing. Uh, it's not like the simple shirt and trusses that our men wear today. It's not like the simple up and down or the gown that our women wear today, it was a kind of flowing apparel. It's like, you know, the native dress today. And if you see some of uh, the people that ride motorcycle and they have the native flowing dress, do you know what they do? They have their loins girded. What does that mean? They, now, they put all the flowing parts together and they tuck it in into a kind of belt, into a kind of a thing that will tie the thing together. So that they will be firm and they will be able to ride that motorcycle properly. That's the same thing the Lord was saying. The Lord was saying, you are going to go out in a hurry. And as you are going to go out in a hurry, you are going to take the journey. Therefore, you, you stalk in into a kind of belt, into a kind of girdle. All the flowing parts, your, your loins girded. And then set your shoes on your feet. It says you should even get ready because at a moment's call, you are ready to leave. And then your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. Do you know that as I said, we too were running a race. And as we are going to, as we are taking the journey, immediately a person is born again. Immediately you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, that is sacrificed for us. You begin running that race and you must not allow your life to be flabby. You must not allow uh, your life to be flowing here and flowing there. You gather everything together. And you quit ye yourself like men. So that you'll be ready to go on on the journey. You are like the athlete that is running a race. And you do not want any weight. You do not want anything to drag you down. You want to be able to do everything properly the way it should be done. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. This is our journey. Let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. Now I read to you in Exodus where it says, For the children of Israel, your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat that Passover in haste, because you are taking your journey. Is there a similar thing for the children of God? Oh yes, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then in verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. 
Verse 14 is important. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. You see that? Exactly that same thing told to the children of Israel. Having your loins girt about with truth. And it says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But then, because we're New Testament believers, we even have more. In verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the, all the furry darts of the wicked. That is, as we take our journey, as we're moving on from here to yonder place, there will be the darts, the arrows of the enemy. There will be the, the arrows and the darts of the devil, the wiles and the strategies of the devil. It says, you will take the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So then we are on a journey. And as we are on a journey, let us make sure that every witch, every hindrance, every disturbance, every compromise, anything that will draw us back, anything that will slow down our journey, anything that will impede the journey, anything that may, that may make us to stumble, anything that may disturb our feet from being free. In taking our journey, we should get rid of everything so that we'll be able to journey to the place we are going and we'll be able to have the strength to carry through and to journey without any hindrance at all. You know, if you remember what God told um, Elijah through that angel, when the angel said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too long for you. That's why we come every time like this, to take the food of the word of God, to drink the water of the word of God, because the journey is long. And only the word of God will be able to strengthen us for the journey. Come back to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot, for that were men beside children. I will come back to verse 38. I want to go through to verse 39. The reason is because verses 39 to 42 we have touched upon before. I'll just read to you and remind you of them. And they baked on living cakes of the dough which they brought forth of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt, and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. But then, please understand, although they were in a hurry, they were not, you know, sometimes when people are going to, on a journey, while they are taking this and taking that, and preparing this and preparing that, they are not able to go out in a hurry. But you know, the Lord wanted them to go out in haste, in a hurry. And so, even though they, their bread and other things they were to eat had not been leavened, and also they had been told they were to keep the feast of the unleavened bread for seven days, they just packed everything in a hurry. And there was not one person that delayed. Now, don't you think this was a beautiful, wonderful thing? 600,000 men, when you think of their wives, when you think of the children, when you think of their cattle, when you think of all that they needed to carry, and yet they were not sluggish. They didn't slow down. They didn't delay. And Moses was not saying, hurry up now. Hurry up now. We're going to be late. The Lord wants us to move out in time. Everyone followed at the sound of the word. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing like that, that we also, in a haste, we haste, we delay not to keep the commandments of the Lord. In verse 40, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years. Even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out, of, out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. It's saying that deliverance was so spectacular. The deliverance was so special and unforgettable that the children of Israel were to continue remembering that throughout their generations. 
And so it is very important for you and I always to keep in mind the day of our own conversion, the day of our own redemption, the day of our own deliverance, the day of our own salvation, so that every time we remember that before the Lord. Now, as they left Egypt, we're told of something very significant in verse 38. And I don't want you to miss this. You mustn't miss this. Every leader in this church should notice very carefully this verse 38. Not only that, every member of this church, everyone that is concerned for the purity of the church, everyone that is concerned for the church remaining the way it ought to be in the mind of God, every one of such people should notice what is recorded for us here in verse 38. Let us look at it now. Exodus chapter 12, verse 38. Exodus chapter 12, verse 38. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. It says, a mixed multitude went up also with them. Mixed multitude. Well, before I tell you what that means, I just want you to realize the, uh, the disturbance that this mixed multitude eventually caused to the children of Israel. I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell at lost in. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? You see what happened here, that eventually the mixed multitude caused problem for them in the land of Israel. It says it was a mixed multitude that first lusted, that first desired, that first had the desire of something that the Lord had not given. And the influence on the children of Israel is that when the, when the mixed multitude fell at lost in, then the children of Israel also went before the Lord. And they began to grumble. They began to murmur. They began to complain, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? And I want you to realize that there is the result of that. In a sense, we are told that God gave them their desires, inordinate affection, but then it, it sent leanness unto their souls. Leanness unto their souls. You see, it, the mixed multitude will always cause a problem. Always cause a problem. I want you to see also in other parts of the Bible the problem caused by mixed multitudes. You see, in, in the time of Nehemiah, the mixed multitude also caused problem among them. And this is the reason why we should be very, very careful of the mixed multitude. In fact, for the uh, children of Israel at the time of Nehemiah. The problem was so much that eventually, you know, they had to deal with they had to deal with that thing, and eventually they had to remove the mixed multitude from them. Look at Nehemiah chapter thirteen. Nehemiah chapter thirteen, verse three. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law, the word of God, that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. They separated from Israel. All the mixed multitude. Now you can see that very clearly. That the mixed multitude had caused them problem. And because of the problem that the mixed multitude had caused them. Eventually they had to separate from them. And it's teaching us a lesson today. An important lesson it is teaching us. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12 verse 38. And a mixed multitude went up with them. We must ask ourselves the question, for what reason did the mixed multitude follow them? What was the cause of the mixed, multi mixed multitude following after the children of Israel? There are three lessons we can, there are three reasons we can identify why the mixed multitude joined them. Number one, because of the miracles they had seen. You see, many of those people in Egypt and of other nationalities that were living in Egypt, a mixed multitude, they had seen the miracles of the plague. They have seen the manifestation of the power of God. They have seen the authority of the word of the man of God, Moses. 
And while these people were going out, they thought it would be good to join these miracle people. It will be good to join these people whose word commands authority and power with heaven. It will be good to join these people who, as a result of their prayers, as a result of their hold on the promises of God, can have miracles upon miracles coming upon them. So, the number one reason, the number one cause, is that because of those miracles, the mixed multitudes decided they were going to join them. And therefore, follow them. And go out of Egypt with them. Number two. You see, while the children of Israel were in Egypt, for those hundreds of years, there had been intermarriages between Israel and Egypt and the nationalities that were in Egypt. Oh, you say, on what ground can you say that? On what ground can you say that the Israelites ever married any of the Egyptians? Well, look at Leviticus chapter 24 and look at it from verse 10. Leviticus chapter 24 and from verse 10. And you will see an example of the people that married the Egyptians. The intermarriage is among them. Leviticus 24 verse 10. And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian. Do you see that? Wife, Israelite, husband, Egyptian. And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel. And the son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And he brought him unto Moses. And his mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Dibri, the, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in watch that the might of the Lord might be showed them concerning what he had done. So you can see examples there of intermarriages between Israel and Egypt. That is, when they had been there, you see, some of those people never thought that they would ever leave Egypt. They thought hundreds of years have gone. They had, they had counted 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years. Since God gave the promise unto Abraham, they never thought they would live again. So they just wanted to settle down and they wanted now to just get married and they were getting married. How like some Christians today, they do not know that the promise eventually will be fulfilled. They do not know that God will provide for them among the people of God. And so they say, well, the promise has been delayed. Uh, one year has gone since I've been praying. Two years have gone. Four years have gone. Let me do something. Because of those intermarriages, the mixed multitude came among the people of Israel. Number three. Now, the third reason why the mixed multitude joined them. Do you know that all the plagues that came upon Egypt had rendered Egypt poor? You see all the locusts that came and destroyed their crops. You see all the insects that came and destroyed their crops. The hail, the fire, the thunder, the storm had destroyed a lot of their crops. You see the moraines and you see the blaze. You see the boils that came upon the animals. Many of those things had been destroyed. Because of that, Egypt had been rendered poor. And because of that poverty, some of the people in Egypt, when they saw Israel going, oh, they said, what are we waiting for? Why are we going to remain in this land of poverty? Because of the declining economy of Egypt, they felt, they felt let us join the people of God. Let us join the Israelites because, after all, we're going to be able to get all our needs met. Three reasons. Number one, uh, the, uh, the miracles. Number two, the marriages. Number three, uh, because of the economy. Are those not the reasons today why sometimes we have mixed multitude in the church? What are the reasons? Number one, attraction of miracles. You see, there are people that have been attracted by miracles. They are not born again. They are not going to be submissive to the word of God. And you will see them, although they say, this is my church. I will never leave this church. But it is like the people that Jesus told, you seek me because you have eaten of those loaves and your bellies are full. Labor not for the things for the meat that perishes, but labor for the things that endure unto life eternal. Are there not many people that have joined this church? Because of miracles, because of healing, because of God giving children to the barren, because you know God has done this and God has done that. 
because of the word of authority, the word of power that has been a sin in our church. Because of that, these people just come without conversion, without redemption, without salvation. And they remain there. Don't they cause us trouble? Oh yes, they cause us trouble. They are the people that grumble. They are the people that complain. They are the people that rebel. They are the people you can see in the addressing. They will not line up with the word of God. They are the people that you will see them. They will not allow themselves to be pushed. They are not going to obey the word of God. They are part of the mixed multitude. Number two, intermarriages. You know, we have some serious brothers in this church. We have some serious, serious, dedicated, devoted brothers in this church. The problem is that their wives are just a, it's a pity. The wives, they have God. Those wives, you will see it in their dressing. You will see it. They almost will use jewelry. If not, because there will be too much talk against them. But you can see their dressing. You can see the way they sew it. You can see the kind of dress. You can see the perforations. You can see the worldliness. You can't push them. You can't talk to them. You can't correct them. They are just part of the mixed multitude. How did they come into the church? Through marriage. Because the husband is in the church, so the wife also is in the church. Sometimes it is the wife that is born again, that is fervent for the Lord. But the husband is just coming. And these are the husbands that no coordinator can talk to. And no zona leader can talk to. These are the people you cannot correct at all. Because it was marriage that is actually keeping them in the church. They are part of the mixed multitude. Number three is because of the poverty in the country. Because of the declining economy in the country. That the people, oh, we hear that deeper life people, they take care of people, they love people, they provide for people, they can give you food, they can give you clothes, they will visit you, they will care for you, and if they don't, I will complain, but I've heard that they, they care for people. Because of that, that is what is keeping them in the church, and they are the mixed multitude. You know, it is a pity when you have multitudes, multitudes, multitudes of people. You don't see evidence of conversion. You don't see evidence of a changed life. You don't see evidence that they know the Lord. You don't see evidence they tremble at the word of God. You don't see evidence they are joining really in a spiritual way, shedding off all the ways that are keeping them down. You don't see the evidence of keeping to the word of God without compromise. They are the people that will dance. They are the people that will drink. They are the people that will smoke. They are the people that bring adultery, fornication into our church. This church that was pure. This church that knew no sin, this church that was just on the move, holiness unto the Lord. These mixed multitudes that have come, oh yes, I'm deep alive. Oh yes, I'm going with them. I am part of them. It may be because of the attraction of miracles, because of the affection for partners in intermarriages, because of attempts to escape poverty and declining economy. They say they are deep alive. They don't dress like deep alive. You know them. You watch them. They say they are deep alive. Their language does not reflect deep alive. They say they are deep alive. Uh, their family style does not reflect deep alive. They say they are deep alive, but they bribe. They say they are deep alive, and they do a lot of atrocities. And they are lawless people, incorrigible people. Those are the mixed multitude. It was a son in the flesh for the children of Israel. And on our side today in this church, the mixed multitude is a son in the flesh. Now listen to me. There are times that uh, some leaders in the local church, in the district church, they are so much in a hurry. They want workers, they want workers, they want workers. Because of that, do you know, they bring mixed multitude into the midst of the workers. And you'll find among so-called workers, people that are not sure of salvation. You'll find, in fact, reports, reports come sometimes, we'll hear that somebody called a zonal leader. I want you to think about this, brothers and sisters. What I'm telling you tonight, sometimes we'll have somebody called a zona leader. And I want you to remember at the time of this, the early time of this revival, the early time of going into the Word of God, the early time of studying the Word of God, the early time when the, when the fire of God, the fire, the purity of holiness was burning in this church. When we say zona leader, oh no, we cannot mention, we cannot mention adultery. We cannot mention fornication. We cannot mention gambling. We cannot mention uh, all these evil things. Today you, you will find somebody they call zona leader, zona leader, zona leader. Immorality is there. Uh, worldly marriage is there. And all the things of the world, they are there. These are the mixed multitudes that have come, entered in the midst of the workers. You know, in the past, when we call somebody a woman representative, 
no high title. A title that once so became a woman representative those days, it's like you know that by the grace of God, they have, they have looked at your life, they have looked at your heart, you have checked yourself, you have prayed, you pray like, not, like nobody. And as you pray like that, eventually you become a woman representative. It was a beautiful, wonderful thing. The revival, the fire of revival would have been pouring in your heart before you can become a woman rep. Don't you see the mixed multitude today? A woman rep committing adultery, a woman rep committing fornication, a zona leader committing fornication. And what are we going to say about area leaders? What are we going to say about house fellowship leaders? What are we going to say about members of the choir? What are we going to say about ushers? You see the mixed multitudes have come because many people are in a hurry. They are in a hurry because they want to multiply the number of workers. Not only that, do you know that now? Nowadays we make announcement upon announcement. We need full-time workers at the press. We need full-time workers in light tears. We need full-time workers in this section. We need full-time workers in that section. I will not tell you a lie. I'm telling you the truth that even into the full-time ministry of the work of God, some mixed multitudes have joined. The people that you really are not sure that they want to do it or die. They, want, they are called of God and they know that woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me if I answer not the call. They are not the kind of people that will say in time of hunger, in time of pain, in time of sickness, in time of difficulty, whether there's money or there's no money, whether there's salary or no salary, whatever it is, I want to answer the call of God. I am called of God. I want to do full time. But you know what we have today? We have the mixed multitude. And the mixed multitude in the church. The mixed multitude among the workers. The mixed multitude among full-time people in the church. Oh, it is costing us dearly. It is costing us dearly. It is costing us problems. Do you know that in the early part of this church, early years, if anybody had been pastor in another church, a worker in another church, a leader in another church, and he wants to run into deeper life, we say no. We say no. We say you can stay in your church. Or if you are going to come to deeper life at all, with all your seminary diploma and certificate, you will, re you will come as a member. And when they have been with us for years, I'm telling you for years, for years, when we have seen them, they are coming out, they are going in, their lifestyle, their dressing, their language, their marriage, their children, their family, and their, their commitment to the word of God. And we see that these are genuine people, bona fide children of the kingdom. It's only then we get them involved in anything at all in the kingdom of God. In recent years, mixed multitudes have come. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because this is a terrible problem and it is a thorn in our flesh. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue like this? Zonal leaders committing sin? Are we going to continue like this? Intermarriages going to marry unbelievers even among people that say they are children of God? The people that have been with us, among our workers, among our leaders, are we going to continue like that? You see, the problem is the mixed multitude that joined them. But the Lord is telling us something in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 6 and verse 17. Here is the word of the Lord, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. Be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'm going to warn you. Don't put your wife among the working team. You know your wife. You know her dressing. You know her language. You know the quarreling at home. How are you going to put somebody who is not Sunday converted among the working team in a church like this? Don't put your seniors, your junior sister, to encourage your junior sister, your junior brother to be part of the church. I'm trying to encourage him so that he can stay with the church. No, we don't need that. We don't need that. If they want to go to another church, it's better for us. Don't put somebody that is a business partner, immediately starts coming to the church, and then you put him in the working team. Don't do that. And don't put, uh, you know, a zona leader that has committed sin, a woman rep that has committed sin, well, because the pastor has not spoken about it, because the pastor has not mentioned our district by name, because our pastor has not called the coordinator, and therefore you just call them back into the work of the Lord. Don't do that. Don't do that. You are spoiling the church. You are destroying the church. You are multiplying the mixed multitude in the midst of the children of God. 
Purge them out. Purge them out. Get rid of them. Let them go back to the back bench. Let them go and pray for salvation. If they are not saved, if they are children of the devil, you know their rebellion. You know their disobedience. You know their worldliness. You know all the evil things they are doing. Let us call upon the Lord and say, Oh Lord, we are going to keep separate. We are going to separate ourselves from the mixed multitude. It is only then the blessings of God will come upon us. Briefly and quickly, let us go to the third point, which is God's instruction to liberated Israel. God's instruction to liberated Israel. I'm reading to you from Exodus chapter 12 and verse 43. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. Do you see that? Oh, I hope you understand the word of God. No stranger shall eat thereof. Oh, this is very meaningful. We don't baptize strangers. Those who are strangers to the grace of God, we don't dip them into water because we want to just baptize anybody. Those who are strangers to the grace of God, we don't allow them to take the Holy Communion with us because we just want the people to feel happy that, you know, this is going on. Those who are strangers, we don't allow them to take to participate in the privilege of the service of the Lord. It says, there shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is, that is bought for money. When thou shalt circumcise him, then shall he eat thereof. But you see anyone that comes in and is willing to go into the circumcision of the heart, into the circumcision of the soul and the spirit, is willing to take the Adamic nature to allow the surgical knife of God, take the Adamic nature away. Those are the people that can partake with us. Those are the people that can come in and go out with us. And then it says, a foreigner in verse 45, a hired servant shall not eat thereof. If, the pe if there are people that are just like the hirelings, and they are there because of the privilege they can have. They are there because uh, they want to be hired servants. If I join Deeper Life, if I join the working team, I will have this, I will have this, I will have that, I will have that. All those people must not partake of that feast of the Lord. It says in, it says in verse 46, in one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad, out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Do you remember talking about the Lord Jesus Christ when he hung on the cross of Calvary? It says that the, because of the coming of the, of the Sabbath, the soldiers went to break the feet and to the, break the bones of all those other people. But then when they got to him, they did not break his bone. Then the Bible says that it might be fulfilled. What the scripture has said, that a bone was not broken. All this is pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Paschal Lamb. And as it says that he shall not break a bone thereof, also his bone was not broken. And then in verse 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. No exception. This is a provision of the Lord and this is what the Lord wants for all his people. All the congregation, everyone, all the children of Israel shall keep it. It says when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. And then let him come near and keep it. He shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. If you have uncircumcised lips and you still tell lies. If you have uncircumcised life and you are not living straight. If you have uncircumcised motives and you are not thinking straight. But if, if you have those uh, parts of your life uncircumcised, you cannot partake with the people of God. You are not part of the people of God. You are just there as, a mix, as part of the mixed multitude. And you have no right. You have no authority. It is not your right to partake with the people of God. But all these things must be done in your heart. You must come to a life that is sober. A life that is given to God. A life that is totally changed and transformed. Become, before you will partake with the people of God. Look at verse 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? There's no double standard in the word of God. Uh, do you know some, some years ago, uh, when we were uh, calling some people IFL, International Fellowship League, and we just had that so as to be able to evangelize the people that are highly placed. Do you know the problem we had? Double standard came in. The IFL people, the rich people, the educated people, they, want to, they wanted to have their own separate doctrine. 
their own separate lifestyle, their own separate attitude, their own separate, you know, kind of a, a sin they would accept. And then the poor people too, the kind of sin they accepted. But here the word of God says, one law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. No double standard in the word of God among the educated, among the poor, the same doctrine. The same manner of life, speak the same thing, do the same thing, live the same way. Among the people who are preaching, among the people that are hearing, no double standard, the same way, the same doctrine, the same lifestyle. Among the university graduates, among the people that didn't go beyond primary school, if you are in this same church, it is one law. One law shall be to the one that is home born and to the one that is a stranger. Among the people that are Nigerians, among the people that are Ghanaians, among the people that are from other countries, if you say you are born again, if you say you are a child of God, if you say we are partaking of the same spiritual bread, drinking of the same spiritual water, if you say we are saved by the same blood of the Lamb, if you say we are in the same kingdom of God, if you say we are reading the same Bible, if you say we are in the same fellowship of their same deeper life, one law, one life, one doctrine, everything that we do, the way we marry, the way we have our children, the way we do our business, the way we conduct our lifestyle, one law shall be unto all, unto everyone, the homeborn, and unto the stranger that shall sojourn among you. Thus did all the children of Israel. Can you read of anything more beautiful than that? Thus did all the children of Israel. Is there anything you can see that can be the sublime? of the devotedness, the devotion of the children of Israel unto God. It says, Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. As the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Can, you, can we say the same thing in this church? That every child, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman, that as the Lord has commanded us from this pulpit, as the Lord has commanded us in all these messages, as the Lord has commanded us in all our literature, in all our cases, in all the messages we're giving us, can we say, as the Lord has commanded, so everyone is doing? Look at all the standards around. Look at the things that are breaking down. Look at this one going this way, the other one going that way. Look at some of the women saying, no, I will not accept that. I will not dress like that. I know who I am. Look at this. Look at the way people are just taking laws into their hands. But it says, Thus did all the children of Israel, all without exception. I'm praying that this will be the day of revival. This will be the day of renewal. I am praying that this will be the day that every one of us will wake up and will pledge our lives into commitment, obedience to the word of God, and will all come, one Lord, one Father, one God, one baptism, and it will be one doctrine and one manner of life, and we'll say the same thing, and we'll have the same mind, and then it says it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Let's come out of Egypt. Let's come out of the world. Let's come out of the sins. Let's come out of the pollutions. Let us come to the Lord. Let there be unity among us. Let there be unity among us. If you have been part of the mixed multitude, why don't you cry unto the Lord? I don't want to be part of the mixed multitude. You don't want to be a son in the flesh to the children of God. A son in the flesh to the people of God. A son in the flesh to even Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Why don't you call upon the Lord and say, Oh Lord, I don't want to be on the fence. I don't want to be outside. I don't want to be a stranger. I don't want to be a foreigner. I don't want to be a person outside the kingdom of God. I want to be obedient to the fullness, the totality, the entirety of the word of God. I want you to rise up. It's your heart like my heart. Is your mind like my, like my mind? Is your devotion like my devotion? Is your attitude to the word of God like my attitude to the word of God? Are we one? Are we one? Are we together? Are we going to do according to the word of God? Are we going to push out the mixed multitude? Are we going to take our stand? Are we going to be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are we going to allow God to do His work within us? Are we going to tell the Lord, Oh Lord, here am I, any spirit of the mixed multitude, any attitude of the mixed multitude, Take it away from me. I want to be in the center of the word of God. I want to carry out the word of God. The word of self-denial. The word of repentance. The word of restitution. The word of holiness. The word of purity. I want to totally give myself unto the Lord. Lead us in this church. I'm so concerned. I hope you are concerned like me. That we children continue to multiply. Meet multitude among us. Let this church be a post church. A holy church. A pure church. 
the church that is marching on according to the word of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord so that the revival of God will come in our midst, will be pure, will be holy, without blemish, without spot, waiting, getting ready for the coming of our Lord. I invite you, don't stay on the fence, don't stay outside there, change that thing, change that language, change that dressing, change that lifestyle. Let's all come together in unity. Don't be part of the mixed multitude. Come in and forge your life and let the blood of Jesus Christ wash you whiter than snow so that we'll be on our way marching unto Zion, marching in their armies. Like them, we will too, on our way to heaven, every weight and every load and every besetting sin, all taken away. Then we can follow the Lord all the days of our lives. Pray unto the Lord before you go. Let the Lord see the genuineness of your heart. Let the Lord see your devotion. Let the Lord see eh, that you want to take the kingdom of God, if necessary, by violence. That you will keep on in the way, in the word of the Lord. You will not deviate. You will not compromise. You will not be among the mixed multitude. You will be among the real people of God, among the hosts of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Let him cleanse you. Let him wash you. Let him change your life. And don't have any agreement with the mixed multitude. Don't make them your closest friends. Don't make them the people that are close to you. Stay with the Lord. And even if the mixed multitude, if they will leave, let them leave. It's better for the church like that. So that we can stay pure. We can stay holy. And then the Lord will be mighty in our midst. Pray on and pray through before you go.